Good morning. I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen, the editor of Streaming Media Magazine, and welcome to our session this morning on latency and the, answering the question, how low should you go? Thanks for joining us here at our fifth Streaming Media Connect. We're all champing at the bit to get back to in-person events, but these virtual events have given us the chance to keep the conversation going while we're still apart. And if you're wondering, we are all systems go for Streaming Media West in Huntington Beach the first week of November. Now, the program is live now. Uh, our producer, Steve Nathans Kelly, will post the URL in the chat. And you can check out the program and also look for the speakers, which we'll be announcing in the next week or two. Before we begin, I would like to thank our diamond sponsor for Streaming Media Connect, and that's Limelight Networks. Thanks to Limelight Networks for making this entire week of events possible. I'd also like to thank the sponsor of this panel, Nanocosmos and Oliver Leitz from Nanocosmos will be joining this discussion on what continues to be one of the hottest topics in the industry. And as I said, that's latency. Oliver, welcome. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Real quickly, if you do have questions for the panel, you can put them in the Q&A tab. The chat is open, but we do ask that you put questions in the Q&A tab and we will get to them throughout the panel and at the end of the discussion. So with that, I would like to introduce Tim Siglin, the founding, I forget what your exact title is, Tim. Founding Executive Director, Help Me Stream founding. Research Foundation. He, that's that's it's short. A mouthful. He, he's the Fed of uh, Help Me Stream Research Foundation, which is doing some great things um, and you know what, since we're asking all the panelists to give a very brief self-introduction, Tim, I'll pass it to you and just tell us a little bit about what Help Me Stream does. Sure. So Help Me Stream um, started, there are a number of us veterans in the industry who know that we've sort of changed the way people consume content. And a couple of years ago, we started thinking about how to bridge the digital divide, especially in emerging economies. So one of the things we started looking at was whether we could collect old end of life servers, old tablets, old smartphones, laptops, and repurpose those into streaming solutions for NGOs and emerging economies. It turns out that really has caught attention from a number of people. And we're now also looking at doing that in disaster areas and rural communities because COVID last year laid bare the fact that even here in the US, we have large swaths of the uh, of the entire uh, country that can't get connectivity, can't get streaming the way that you and I can can enjoy it. So that's just a brief synopsis of uh, Help Me Stream. All right, Tim, and I'll pass it over to you to introduce the rest of the panelists and start the discussion. Sure. Um, Oliver, I'm going to start with you. And I know you have uh, just a couple quick slides to talk briefly as sponsor about um sort of where you define latency, because latency is a, is a wide swath of time, you know, depending on where you sit in the process. So as a, uh, my name is Oliver Lied, CEO and founder of Nanocosmos from Berlin. And um, we provide a complete integrated live streaming platform, which we call Nanostream Cloud, which is based on an ultra low latency network with a unique player and additional tools like metrics and uh, analytics. Um, we own the whole workflow with our software and installed on many servers on our content delivery network. And it's very easy to use Nanostream Cloud for your own live streaming workflow. You send a live stream to us, we do the delivery around the world and you can play it with our player, which is running on all browsers. This includes live transcoding and adaptive, uh, adaptive bitrate to also adjust to hostile client networks and keep the user experience as high as possible. We license the platform for commercial customers for white label integration and customer pages. Nanocosmos has now been active in the broadcast industry for many years, founded in 1998, and we introduced Nanostream Cloud already five years ago. So let me share directly some typical examples of interactive live streaming, what we consider as uh, interesting for low latency live streaming. Um, Town hall with the podium discussion. This can be either based on a business meeting with a company or enterprise environment, or based on a public audience joining the discussion from anywhere in the world. So the target latency for this town hall meeting is uh, one second to really enable the audience to engage and to interact based on Q&A, uh, any kind of feedback the audience directly has to the presenters. We also more and more see uh, this going to the virtual meeting space like we do now. So have the presenters in a virtual meeting room 
like in Zoom or Jitsi or the uh, meeting applications, which then is shared to large audiences on a web page. Here's an overview of uh, further use cases for low latency live streaming, webcasts and town halls I already mentioned. A lot of um, use cases around sports betting, live auctions and gaming, which directly have a monetized business model behind it. And also specific applications like, like uh, live retail where you, do, where you do directly sales online. So all these applications have one thing in common that they are interactive directly. You cannot go without any interaction. You require low latency to enable this interaction and this must be around one second end to end glass to glass. And back to the moderator, thanks. So I think that sets the stage in terms of latency as, as Oliver mentioned, you know, we've got latency we typically think about in the early days of streaming and we've got latencies in the tens to low hundreds of milliseconds for interactive. I came out of video conferencing, so I, I lived in that in that interactive world for quite some time. It's a very good stage to set. Um, Crystal, we'll go next to you. If you'll just introduce yourself briefly and um, yeah. tell us about your company and your time in the industry. Sure. Um, so my name is Crystal Mejia. I am a lead video engineer for Viacom CBS. Um, I've spent all my time in video at Viacom CBS, formerly CBS Interactive, before there was that merger a few years back. Um, I spent time working on live streaming and infrastructure specifically for, for CBS Sports Digital for a few years before I moved over to a platform team, um, the Video Technology Group. And the Video Technology Group were focused on advanced technologies for the broader uh, Viacom CBS portfolio. So we work with various different brands. Um, and provide various different services. And, and one of the teams that I work on is the, the origin team. And so we're focused on video packaging, manifest manipulation, um, services like that. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And Robert Reinhardt, um, who shocked us all earlier today with not looking like his picture. Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about Video RX and yourself in the industry. Uh, thank you, uh, Tim. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, again, my name is Robert Reinhardt. Uh, I've been in the streaming industry, I guess, ever since I've been working uh, and had my own uh, company in 1999 in Los Angeles. Uh, um, I started in Flash video. I wrote lots of Flash uh, books and did lots of Flash applications around streaming video. Uh, and that was a great transition into HTML5 for me. Uh, I wasn't as, uh, as upset as many when Flash went away. Uh, and uh, uh, today, I continue to basically serve as a video, I call myself a video solutions architect, where uh, I basically troubleshoot and uh, rethink people's streaming and deployment workflows. And so, um, you know, I, I, uh, low latency is definitely in uh, the top tier of most of my work over the last couple of years, even before COVID. Cattle auctions, wine auctions, uh, those are um, obviously an auction is something where you need uh, sub one second latency if possible. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be on this panel uh, and uh, uh, contribute to the conversation. Thank you, Tim. And you apparently got a shout out, Robert, from uh, Tucker Smediker, um, I believe is how he says his name, from the old mobile flash team. So you're, oh. your fans are following you here. Oh, thanks. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go, uh, Oliver, a question for you. So, um, you deal with ultra low latency uh, where some others on the panel may deal with sort of low latency. How do you, uh, what are the challenges of getting to ultra low latency? Because when we're talking about streaming at scale and we start talking about throwing interactivity into that, what are some of the challenges that you face or that you find your customers face? Sure. So first of all, uh, ultra latency is not easy as video and digital video is not easy as we all know. And uh, really controlling the end-to-end -end workflow somehow is mandatory for these use cases um, because uh, one of the challenges is the whole delivery part um, to be available on all devices, really in ultra low latency and to control that uh, from the ingest part coming from the camera that can go, uh, a lot of things can go wrong. Uh, sending the stream upstream to a network and providing a um, platform which provides the delivery uh, to all devices is really a great challenge. So that's uh, where we invested a lot of work into and uh, we noticed that um, really it was very helpful to build that ourselves 
to have control on all software components. And also one important thing uh, we also learned that uh, getting information from the players about the user experience, uh, which is um, very important to get some business intelligence behind that. It uh, was uh, important for us to add metrics and analytics to the platform, which really helps our customers getting more insight into the quality of service of the whole workflow. Now, Crystal, you mentioned that you were in live. Um, and I know one of the things you had mentioned to me before we went on air was sort of the trade-offs you have when you're deciding on how much latency. Oliver mentioned quality of service and analytics and those kinds of things. Are, are those also important for your decisioning at Viacom CBS? Yeah, I mean, for us, you know, obviously low latency is important, especially when you think about what kind of live event you're streaming, but it's such a balance between latency, quality of the experience and quality of service. Um, and it's really hard, I think, to optimize for all three of these things. You know, usually depending on the type of event you're streaming, if it's sports, you start to put more emphasis on video quality, like how can we get HDR, 4K content, which that's gonna inherently add more latency to your stream, right? Versus maybe breaking news and you have talking heads at a studio, you can maybe give up a little bit on quality and focus more maybe on latency or, or the quality of service. And so we have to balance all of those things. And you know, something that Oliver mentioned was right, being able to control that whole end-to-end -end workflow. I think on the broadcast side, very difficult for us because we work with so many partners um, and so being able to control all those different components in your video pipeline becomes problematic. And, and so all those different components, whether it's video ingest, the video player implementation, the encoding packaging piece, sometimes you have to start thinking about it latency at those specific systems uh, within the chain versus the full end to end, because it just becomes really difficult for us to, to manage all of that. So Oliver, to, to Crystal's point there, you know, how do you manage sort of the end to end? I understand you all have a player, as you mentioned in your intro. Um, what other ways do you sort of manage that whole process? Yeah, well, we have not only the player, but also the server software. We pick up the stream directly from the ingester, from the encoder. And I agree to Crystal that sometimes you don't have full control about what is coming to you as a network. But then it's important to have that bits and bytes together and uh, control that. And based on the use case you would like to solve, then focus on that. And uh, also what Crystal said was very much um, important that you need to focus on what would you like to solve? What's your use case? Do we have a monetized business model behind that? Do you, would you like to reach as many um, viewers as possible in a kind of lean back experience? Or is it more lean forward that, that someone interacts with you? So for these applications, which uh, then more and more happen on mobile phones, you don't need a 4K uh, signal. It's more the, more important that it uh, stays reasonable on the on the mobile device. You have uh, additional elements on, on the application which uh, enable your interaction. So it's very much dependent on what you would like to solve. In particular use cases, that makes sense. So Robert, take us up to a high level view. I mean, standing here in the middle of 2021, what are sort of the the low latency options that people have available today? Um, yeah, I, I mean, generally speaking, and again, high level here, uh, the options that we can use today, you know, you have your traditional HLS, which is going to give you latency. You can get regular HLS pretty low. It, 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 you know, you get it. I've, I've had clients where I've tweaked it to get as low as three seconds, um, and that would include at scale uh, using the right load balancing technology. Uh, you also now have low latency HLS, which is a little too bleeding edge. It, you know, it hasn't really been fully, uh, you know, put through its paces. It's still changing somewhat. I, I make the tech joke that I consider it like, I, I don't know if you all remember when pre-N came out for wireless home technology, like really, we haven't even ratified the N spec and we're selling hardware around it. And so, you know, I always have clients coming to me wanting to use bleeding edge technology, but they never want to accept the fact that it's bleeding edge. And by definition, it's going to be rough on the edges, right? And it's not going to work in a lot of use cases that they want it to work. And, uh, and then after that, uh, after low latency HLS, um, you, when you want to get to more of the real time 
transactions. Uh, NanoCosmos, for example, has with NanoStream, they, they use WebSockets for a lot of the end-to-end uh, -end, uh, um, low latency options. They also now uh, are using WebRTC uh, for their meeting platform and it's well integrated into the rest of their options. Full disclosure, I, I did work with NanoCosmos to work to review their uh, platform a few months ago, so I'm well aware of it. I've worked with several CDNs over the years to evaluate their, their backends and give them my thoughts on it. Uh, but yeah, and so we got WebSockets, uh, which has been around for a long time and you can, you know, it's just a binary transfer, uh, but it is uh, uh, more responsive than uh, you would get with HTTP, um, pardon me. <clears throat> and then WebRTC for sub, sub one second and WebRTC does have uh, some issue. I mean, so if you really need that low latency right now, we don't, uh, again, Flash was sort of there with RTMP back in the day, but now we have WebRTC that can utilize UDP and TCP. Again, trying to keep this really high level and quick, uh, but uh, you know, uh, for me- that was, that was a good pun there, Robert, yeah. UDP and quick. Uh -huh. <laughs> Go ahead. But, uh, but yeah, and, and, you know, if you're not familiar with the differences between TCP and uh, UDP, uh, UDP is a fire and forget type of protocol. They they're they're augmenting WebRTC so that you can uh, renegotiate lost packets even over UDP. But um, generally speaking, um, you're going to get you know if you need browser compatibility, um, WebRTC is the way to go. Of course, if you have smartphone apps, you you can you can be like Zoom, like we are here. They're using proprietary technology that's not WebRTC uh, and still very low latency. So uh, it really depends on those business requirements. I you know if you read my column in Stream Media Magazine. I always try to attack this, any problem, including low latency with what are your business requirements and let's go from there. Let's not look at the tech stacks that you have right now. Let's look at what you wanna do and how you're gonna get there most cost effectively. Fair point, fair point. So just a quick housekeeping thing for everybody. If you've got questions, you can uh, put them in the Q&A part of Zoom here. Um, Crystal, so Robert's talked about, you know, from HLS down to WebRTC, what are some of the reasons to use HLS these days, even though WebRTC is faster from a latency standpoint? Yeah, and, and I think Robert kind of hit the nail on the head there. It's all around your business requirements. And so for us, like as a broadcaster, right, our, big, our biggest commitment is to our partners, our, advertis our advertisers. And so we have to start thinking about, you know, when we stream an event, it's how do we need to scale that event? What support on, on the device side do we need for that event? Um, uh, the security concerns is their revenue uh, attached to this event. And so you start adding these components in the HLS chain, um, whether it's a DAI service, a DRM service, um, you need the reliability of, of TCP and HTTP, right? That TCP handshake becomes important, you know, and even though that adds latency, we need to think about all those other business requirements. And so, um, right, as you start to add DRM, DAI, these, you have to be flexible and you have to be able to take advantage of, I guess, technologies that have been tried and proven. You know, something Robert mentioned was like LLHLS and, you know, it's bleeding edge. It's not really been put through the paces. And so for us, we can't really go after technology like that until we have, you know, the reliability that, it, that it's going to be able to deliver and perform for us. And not just that, the having the players on the end that will receive HLS, low, low LLHLS and know what to do with it as well. So, right. So, um, so we talked about Quick, Robert, and I know I sort of made a joke there, but but Quick is the idea of taking UDP and making it as reliable as TCP through some tricks, and obviously it's part of HTTP three. What's your general sense of whether we're going to see adoption of that sooner rather than later? Do you have customers coming to you and saying, "Hey"? you know, help me figure out this HTTP3 strategy. Uh, I do. And, uh, you know, like I said, last year, I did a lot of bleeding edge uh, R&D for companies that were hoping to put those products to market, you know, last year already. And again, it, I have to joke about historically, like I'll never forget you know, when I uh, when I worked at Schematic as VP of Multimedia Applications, when I lived in LA, I worked with ABC, NBC, other broadcasters on different projects, and they didn't want to touch Flash until that Flash player adoption reached an insane high adoption, like 98, 99%. And, and they would want it to be backwards compatible to a Flash that was 
you know, well established. And Flash, of course, got out there way more quickly than a browser update did, right? Because to update your browser, you know, it takes some uh, due diligence, uh, especially in enterprise. But anyway, aside from that, you know, I am, I, it always astonishes me against that backdrop that clients are willing to, you know, go after these marginal sects of, uh, or marginal uh, uh, portions of the demographic that, uh, as, as Crystal was just saying too, you know, it, it, with the business requirements, you need to satisfy so many things. And, um, you know, if you try to tell them like, well, you're using this media server technology and it can't do negative acknowledgement with WebRTC. So you, you're gonna have a poor experience if a person can't negotiate over UDP, if you fall back to TCP, we're going to have a higher latency and and you know and they're like well why is that the case and you know i i can't change the de facto situation with technology so um you know I, again i think today you know i i, I like in web the problem with webrtc is ultimately i feel scale it's expensive to scale webrtc right you can't just throw cloudfront in front of webrtc and be done with it right or some you know huge cdn's uh, http edge technology to it so um it's expensive but companies were willing to pay what they called the flash tax back in the day because RTMP wasn't easy to scale either, right? It was real time. Uh, it was a lot more uh, flexible with TCP, uh, but um, I don't know if that satisfies your question, but it is, you know, it, it's just difficult to, I, I find get clients to really embrace what it means to be using bleeding edge today. Like, you know, by definition, you're, you're going after a less established audience than you are with something else. And to a certain extent, it's the same problem we had with the uh, HTML5 um, video tags, you know, quite some time ago, where we would, um, you you always had to have that failover in place, as you say. So, so Oliver, you know, as uh, Robert mentioned, you all, you focus on the, the WebSockets, WebRTC, how, how does scale come into play for you and our companies uncomfortable paying a premium price because they got used to the flash tax and from what i understand you know webrtc at scale is is considerably more expensive or at least has the perception of being more expensive yeah the um we noticed that the, the technology is not only uh, not leading anymore for our customers it's of course leading for us to provide the best solution to them but we um, also needed to be competitive uh, for a global scalable system for customers anywhere in the world, uh, South America, Asia, whatever they are, they are all price sensitive. So uh, we do a hybrid approach. We embraced WebRTC early on. Uh, we decided to keep it on the ingest and broadcaster side, more browser-based uh, live encoding. There are big challenges around that also quality wise. It's not uh, really a high um, profile. It's more baseline profile. It's really meant to be used for video communication primarily and not for such a large scale. So we also do uh, this WebSocket approach uh, on certain devices. We also do ultra low latency HLS based on our own protocol. So we keep that all from our customers and we can scale very well with this solution and keep the price reasonable. So it's uh, not something we keep unique as a premium service for our customers for ultra low latency. It's more like a standard service. and every customer gets that so and, and that's the expectation right now and it's much more than implementing the uh, technology bits and bytes you need to provide a good user experience uh, to to build a player and 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 a distribution system based on these technologies really very complex so we learned our lessons and uh, it's something which usually works quite well when you did some do some prototyping and good networks but it starts to get very challenging in um, hostile networks all around the globe and comes to adaptive bitrate and at scale and all these things. So, and that's things uh, customers don't want to worry about nowadays. So they want to have something which they can embed on their web page. You see more and more customers coming from vertical segments, which don't have any clue on uh, digital video. They don't know what compression is. They don't know what an artifact is. They just want to embed video on their web page and. They also need to learn the lesson that you sometimes need to make compromises so you can't stream a highest quality signal to a, um, a low end mobile phone. But that's things that they uh, want us to care on and not them. They want, want, don't want to do that themselves. That's a good point. So, Crystal, you've been involved in live for quite some time and, you know, on the broadcast side with partners. 
um, you know, Oliver was mentioning networks globally being potentially hostile, but also you've got a lot of legacy devices that you have to deal with um, and add things like DRM. What are some of the learnings that, that you've come away from, you know, doing that kind of work and finding on how decisions are made for what network or what partners um, require, say, in one part of the world versus everybody else in the rest of the world? Yeah, um, you know, I think the nice thing about being an engineer is you're more focused on the how things are done. And so you don't have to focus too much on those business requirements. You know, us on the tech, on the platform side, we rely obviously on the brands, the business to tell us what those numbers and metrics are. Really all we can do is, is provide the data that says the more, you know, components we add to this chain, the more, you know, if latency is a huge target, they have to understand that this is how much latency we're gonna be introducing. And so, you know, you look at an event like say Super Bowl, where we start to make trade-offs and say, we're gonna bypass DAI because we don't think we could even scale the DAI service to handle those, you know, those many concurrents. Um, you know, we have the data to sort of show that and then we can say, okay, we're gonna try to figure out how to embed the, the ads in the stream and generate revenue that way. And so we start to look at other trade-offs, but ultimately, right, once the business understands their requirements, you know, as an engineer, you can start to sort of look at all those different components and eliminate them from your video pipeline if needed, or optimize the, those places and, and look at redundancy in those places, regardless of it introduces latency or more latency or not. Um, I wanted to ask Crystal a follow up on that because, you know, you and I wear some similar hats. Uh, you know, I, I do engineering as well. Uh, but because I'm a consultant, I, I, I wanted to ask, like, how often do you find that the people you're working with, whether they're partners, don't understand what their business requirements are and you have to help inform them. Like they'll come to you with some assertions thinking that they understand it, but they really don't. And what they're asking might be counterintuitive or counterproductive to what they want to achieve. Yeah, and I mean, that that happens a lot. I mean, the the right, we build a platform and we say, we can do DAI, we can do DRM, we can do everything. And people think we'll just plug and play and they don't understand, I guess, on, on output, what the implications are, and even just on setting up events like, like the, of that nature. And so depending on your experience, and, and a lot of people really from a business perspective, they just understand data and numbers and don't necessarily understand the technology under the hood. And so really we do a lot of work to, I think, share knowledge here about the limitations we run against um, because you know the ultimate thing for us is obviously reliability and the quality of service and so we'll 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 give up on on video quality or latency as needed um, all depending on the brand and, and their business requirements so robert um we've talked about web browsers a little bit you know plugging video into web browsers um is that you know we seem to shift back and forth in the industry to do it all in apps, do it all in, you know, streaming appliances like an Apple TV or Roku or what have you, or do it all in browsers. Where do we sort of sit right now, you know, considering latency, but also considering sort of the broader picture of where people want to consume content? It's getting better, I guess, is what I could say in terms of, you know, I, I, I still, I would say right now, the vast majority of the clients I'm working with want browser-based technology. And I, I think that, that that is based on the perception that, A, it's cheaper to maintain, I mean, overall, right? I mean, making sure that you're compliant with a wide range of browsers. I still have clients that do medical streaming, for example. It's a niche market, so they can force people to always use Chrome, right? Like if you come to the site and you're, you know, you're a, a pharma rep and you are there in Safari, it's going to say, hey, you have to use Chrome. So in some ways, you know, we haven't gotten there yet with people's safety level or comfort. Uh, the good news is, app, you know, Apple was sort of the, the last sort of hold out for WebRTC, you know, and it's funny because like just as a low tech example or low level tech, you know, Safari supports VP codex now, but only in WebRTC. You can't throw a WebM file in a video tag and have it play in Safari. They don't, they, they don't want you to do that. And so, um, you know, there are, uh, and that will probably change over time. Heck, it might've even changed while I'm talking. I don't know, but uh, the, uh, um, or, or a month ago, I haven't tested it, but um, anyway, aside from that, um, 
I do find that, you know, that is one of the nice things about WebRTC. It, it is getting more and more established in, in, in browsers. And so therefore you can, you know, do this dev once deploy everywhere kind of approach. Uh, and, and, you know, so I, again, it's, I think business requirements and Crystal brought it up before too, and, and Oliver with user experience. I mean, you know, I, I think, getting your pieces together so that they make sense. I mean, one of the things I really liked about working with, with Oliver at NanoCosmos when I was reviewing their platform was that they were doing things in a really sensible way, which, you know, you would hope happens more often than not. But, you know, when it comes, like, like this Zoom presentation, it matters that all of us have low latency, right? I want to be able to talk to you. You want to be able to cut me off or whatever. You know, it, it, it's that's important. But the people watching this and even commenting on the chat they don't need that low latency, right? Someone can ask a question right now and it can be delayed because we're in the middle of a conversation. Steve might pick it up and, you know, bring it to someone's attention, but they don't have to be watching this broadcast in, in ultra low latency, right? And that's how NanoCosmos has built their platform, right? Like we, if we were using NanoCosmos for this, we would be doing this over WebRTC, but they've built it so that this their ingest will automatically put push out an hls or WebSocket version of this that's much cheaper to you know maintain and enhance and still give that quality of experience that people need in in that situation so i think that's part of the trickiness right now is that you know figuring out how, and crystal you brought this up again too like just getting all those parts working together so that they satisfy the business requirements it makes fiscal sense the way you're deploying it and uh, uh you know again I, I think the hardest thing for me is when i get startups that want to offer a free version of their service as well as a premium version of their service so yeah, like a freemium model um and they they look at price tags like oh i don't want to pay you know, five hundred or a thousand dollars a month to a platform. It's just like, well, you realize your dev costs are going to be astronomical compared to just starting with a platform that is doing a lot of that for you anyway, right? So, um, uh, my latest column, which hasn't been published for streaming media yet, addresses this this issue from a business perspective of just you know, be put the thought into that 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 process of like where what's your roadmap going to be around um and i didn't call it low latency in my latest column i called it real-time interaction like what needs to be real time and what needs to not be real time or you know just behind real time so you know uh, I, I think when you put it in in different perspectives for uh, uh clients and partners it can help them start to understand what those problems really mean so anyway i no, that's very good. And I wasn't going to cut you off because you were saying pertinent things. So, um, but but interactivity, I think, is one of the key takeaways we need to take away from this. When you're talking about ultra low latency, the interactivity portion of it, if it's video and audio like this, obviously it has to be very low latency. When it comes to things like polling or chat or questions, those things don't necessarily have to be. Um, so, so Crystal, Robert mentioned that when he worked with Flash, you know, it was 95, 97% adoption of Flash before the broadcasters would look at it. Is there a model that says eventually the, you know, somebody like Viacom CBS would do interactive? Because clearly you think about game shows and the ability to have people be part of that, you know, live, maybe not necessarily with their video being shown, but, but obviously the latency has to be low enough if you got people around the country trying to all answer first or something like that. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, this use case has come up a bit, I think, when people start talking about like sports betting and, and what that interactivity is gonna look like if it is an interactive component, because you're gonna wanna be as close to real time um, as you're sort of showing all this betting gambling data right on screen when, and whether users are interacting with that. Um, you know, and I've, you've seen, I think when you look at something like Twitch and how they're doing a lot of the interactive component work, you know, clients are interacting with the broadcasters, you know, not sure that you're going to be interacting with, with sports teams on the field, but are you interacting with broadcasters? Is there going to be a two-way communication at some point? Um, you know, I think sports, sports is just content to me that I think is the biggest driver in innovation. And, I, and I'm curious to see if broadcasters start to dive deeper into an interactive experience in sports rather than just rely on a lean back experience. Good, 
good, good. So Will Law, who's um, those of us who have been in the industry for quite some time know very well, he's one of the architects at Akamai. He asked a question, and I'll throw this out to, to any of you. Um, can you comment on web transport as the planned evolution for WebSocket and RTC data, data channel for applications leveraging low latency transmission? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> The question, maybe it's too early to answer that because um, web transport is not available everywhere yet. And um, WebSocket is available everywhere, so it works. And uh, there are, uh, the same for RTC data channel, it's also not working everywhere. So it very much depends what you would like to achieve. And I think it might be a future option uh, for these protocols. Do we get this solved with HTTP3? Do we have to wait that long? Or is it something that maybe gets solved? <laughs> that yeah i think it's also a bit early to decide uh, i think it's interesting that google themselves who basically invented or at least introduced web rtc they also are moving to things like web torrents port for their gaming platforms and not using web rtc which is uh, an interesting sign in my opinion so there is a lot of development under the hood in these things um, but um, these are still too early to to adopt in my opinion so it takes a bit to to uh, have a full distributed availability on all devices. And uh, maybe the other question, as our team, if I may answer my opinion directly, um, that's more non-browser based. So it might be interesting for ingest from professional backends, but it's not available in the browsers. Robert, what are you seeing in terms of SRT adoption? Because obviously that that's a hot topic as well. Yeah, I, you know, I, I honestly don't think SRT is going to evolve into this uh, deployment mechanism. Uh, it certainly has helped uh, uh, some of the uh, work that I've done with clients uh, last year, particularly with Ingest. Uh, I, I did a, a job with Reebok uh, in a video, a, a production company that worked with Reebok's CrossFit uh, competition last year. And, and we had some pretty interesting tech requirements. So I'm only going to go into this really quickly, but uh, you know, we were using a free application on um, um, Larix um, Broadcaster, which um, uh, Softbell makes. Um, um, they, they've been at Stream Media in the past, but long story shorter, uh, we were. It was great. We were able to use SRT with HEVC. This is the problem with RTMP ingest uh, and even WebRTC ingest is that while well, WebRTC is codec agnostic, so is WebSockets, so will be Web Transport. At the end of the day, you need to have those codecs somewhere so that you can encode and decode with them. Uh, but I think SRT will remain a player in the ingest for for the foreseeable future, simply because RTMP can't do anything beyond H.264, right? And so, you know, all the social media platforms are still using RTMP for live ingest because it's well established, it's available, uh, all the hardware and software can work with it. WebRTC is going to be hard to do that with, right? I've, 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 I've tried to get the community rallied around um, creating more of a standards approach to WebRTC. Uh, what Millicast has uh, sort of picked up that flag with what they called WIP, working with uh, the people who created Janus to have a standard handshake. I mean, that's one of, again, these technologies all sound great on paper, but even web transport, it's just a specification. At the end of the day, you still need to develop something around it that the, that the industry will embrace, right? If I develop a web transport ingest that's very custom and proprietary, I'm not going to get a whole. I'm not going to get you know Teradek and you know uh, Asia to you start building hardware around it, right? I mean, it, it's got to have a you know and. For better or worse, Flash did at least make RTMP standard enough. You know, they opened the spec, and you know, people sort of just you know get gravitated to it at that point. Um, I think that's good. You know, so much looks good on paper right now. We, I mean, even HEVC, right? We don't have standard HEVC workflows yet, right? Because you know, there's licensing around it. Uh, there, uh, so you know, I. Um, uh, but you asked specifically about SRT. I, I don't think it's going to go anywhere fast. I think it's still going to be uh, important for the, again, business requirements, some business work requirements. SRT is going to be a great fit for it. Uh, but I don't think it's going to necessarily, I don't think I'm going to be playing SRT anytime soon. Every server config that I've looked at with SRT, it's a pretty complicated config, almost as complicated as WebRTC. So, you know, if you want to start mapping ports for SRT, you know, it, it gets 
it, it you know i just again i always think of flash and how when we did work with disney you know invariably there was someone higher up who would complain that the firewall was blocking rtmp well you know so much has to update around these specs if you're doing deep packet inspection and only allowing certain http traffic through then you could be dead in the water with so much of what we're talking about right and so uh again I, as i brought up with crystal making sure that everyone who's involved in in the stakeholder pipeline understands the implications of what these tech stacks are bringing to the business requirements um ultimately i you know that's you know uh, you know, I, I don't want to be like the, the G.I. Joe cartoons when I was growing up, but knowing is half the battle. Uh, it is half the battle, if not more these days. But um, anyway, um, um, I, I went off topic there. No, no, no. <laughs> I was going to say you, two key points you, you talked about there. One is SRT good on the ingestion side. Um, and obviously there are a lot of forward error correction solutions from the ingest side that really help is, is you carry content in. Um, I mean, we had Zixi on as a research keynote a, a couple of months ago, and we talked about that topic in depth. The other thing is when you talk about the standards, and I, get, I think back to when I was in video conferencing when we were dealing with, you know, very low um, millisecond rates, typically 70 milliseconds or lower, you had to have an ITU standard, you had to have an MPEG standard, and now we have to have an IETF standard because when you're when you're looking at things like WebRTC, it doesn't build, it, while it may use RTP and RTSP, it doesn't build on things like SS7 or SIP, which were the, the early ways to handle this. So in some ways we're, we're sort of reinventing the wheel because everybody has their own proprietary solutions we need to come to a standard. I, that's what I took away from what you were saying in that particular model. So Crystal, when we mentioned SRT, and sorry, Oliver, I'll come back to you in just a minute, but Crystal, when we mentioned SRT and forward error correction, you know, there's NDI as well, which is now sort of part of the conversation. Do you all find that from the ingest or origin side, you're having to rely on that kind of thing to bring content in from remote locations? Yeah, and I, I, you know, ultimately it does depend on the remote location or the source that we're pulling that from. So we have some events, we've used Zixi in the past for ingest, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's essentially the, it was the best way for us to sort of get our, our stuff in the cloud. But even we tried to even eliminate parts of, of that chain where we had to bring in the source into the broadcast center before you even pushed it up to the cloud. And so for us, we, we always try to push back and say, how can we get closer to the source? Where are you capturing from? Um, it's largely out of like our purview because we're always focused from the broadcast side, the OTT side of the workflows and we kind of work in parallel with broadcast engineers. And so some of our needs are a little different there. Um, but similar to what Robert said, I think some of these, you do have to look at the ingest side of it and SRT, you know, some of these um, protocols, you're gonna see them more on the ingest side. I don't see how you're ever gonna use that um, on output to the clients. Uh, Oliver, I think you started to have a comment a moment ago. Yeah, I completely agree what uh, Crystal and Robert were saying. And um, on the interest side, as a professional broadcaster, you have much more freedom. You can use professional protocols. You can use expensive stuff like whatever Live View or Zixi or newer uh, things uh, which are more open, like SRT, which also still require professional live encoder software or hardware. So that's uh, that's the contribution side, but the distribution side is the major challenge for the large audience. So to reach as many people as possible with, uh, on any device, you somehow stick to the browser. Usually, we see more and more cases coming to the browser, and um, it's it's challenging. And we try to solve all these um, uh, challenges, uh, and I think we do quite well. I mean, it's interesting that we are now uh, what we are doing now. We are using. As all streaming professionals, we are using a proprietary platform like Zoom. It just works. You can log in, you can join it very easily, but the user experience is still limited, right? So you don't have the browser experience. You cannot combine that very well to your own branded environment. And so there are pros and cons, and uh, there's still um, a bit to go to really work on these use cases going beyond the, the protocol. So really have a look at the application what would you like to bring to the uh, to the participants and how would like what benefit do i have and how can i monetize that content 
So we're going to do one last round of questions. And Oliver, I'm going to start with you. Um, what are some of the most interesting lessons learned out of these interactive or low latency use cases that, that NanoCosmos has faced? Yeah, I think what I just mentioned that um, we, most requests we get from business customers are browser based. So it's not like uh, in the last couple of years that many um, brands would like to create their own apps for mobile devices. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot browser based applications with instant access on any device. Uh, whatever device you have, uh, there are still some legacy, legacy devices in the market and uh, newer devices which are more powerful, any kind of network you have. Uh, that's, that's a good learning for us that uh, these browser-based, module-based approach to combine things easily together for non-experts somehow um, to focus on the business model is, uh, is very important. And uh, mentioning the business model, you have to have a clear understanding of uh, good monetization of your content. Otherwise, you might uh, disappear very soon. So we have seen these things like HQ Trivia quiz applications, things like uh, whatever Periscope, which is merged with uh, Twitter now, uh, which have the power and value to make it free, but uh, for uh, small, medium, and even large uh, environments and professional environments with uh, revenue-based monetization, you need to have a clear understanding about how, how, you, how you earn money with the content. So Robert, I'm going to come to you next with that sort of same question, most interesting use cases, but I want to remind the audience, um, we've got about 10 minutes left here. So if you've got questions that you want to ask, please put them in the, the Q&A. So Robert, um, what are some of the most interesting use cases you're seeing with low latency and lessons learned around those? Yeah, I, I think last year was a, a great, a good learning curve for not only myself, but clients. I mean, I, I certainly... Uh, was working with WebRTC and clients wanting to use WebRTC before COVID, uh, but it wasn't as as critical as when COVID hit. And so people, and again, uh, the end of life of Flash uh, certainly accelerated the adoption to something because you you could pull off fairly low latency that was low enough for auctions to work. Like I were I, I built. Uh, cattle and wine auctions with RTMP playback um, it, with legacy systems. And, you know, when clients put a ton of money into flash dev, even if it was five or eight years ago, you know, they, they wanted to maximize that for as long as they could. And so um, I would say, you know, um, not every server technology is created equal. Uh, there were a lot, there's a lot more moving parts with WebRTC than there were with, was with uh, RTMP. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I won't name names with server technologies because I don't want to get into that. But, you know, uh, I definitely had to move clients that were using established media server technologies to other media server technologies because the WebRTC was too uh, immature, I guess, if I was to use a word in, in some platforms that hadn't fully developed it out than other, you know, open source did, you know, I mean, um, Oliver and, and with NanoCosmos, they're, they're transparent. I, I wrote it in my review of their service that they're using Jitsi on the back end uh, and Jitsi's open source, just like Janice is. Um, of course, all of these uh, open source um, Code bases now have a commercial licensing available with it too. Uh, if you want, you know, the things that commercial licensing adds to the equation, like support, for example, you don't get support with open source just out of the box unless it's from the dev community. Uh, and um, but uh, I think the the most interesting use cases for me are those that again make sense that they don't try and do an all or none approach. That um, I think uh, like so many things uh, I. Um, when I do live streaming events uh, pre-COVID, you know, in person now, I'm doing more virtual tech uh, direction. And I, I wanted to mention that too, as a, a different aspect of low latency. Many of us that tech direct live events now have to have pretty, you know, super low latency in controlling remote computers now, right? Because uh, just before I left for the trip I'm on now, I was tech directing a, a live indigenous event stream for the uh, provincial government uh, using a vMix uh, uh, installation on AWS. And I had a very bad hotel connection uh, at the time when I was traveling to do this. They, they knew it. So I had to plan lots of contingencies for that redundancy. Uh, I ended up using my hotspot on my phone because I was able to RDP over that to the instance much better than I could with 
uh, even the paid hotel connection. And so, um, you know, I, I think um, one of my clients is really big on redundancy. And I think the, you know, it costs to have levels of redundancy, but I think that's the interesting thing with all these technologies is that you often have, to, just like you had fallbacks with Flash too, you have to have your fallbacks in place, right? So if something doesn't work, you either have to make that incredibly clear to your stakeholders that all of these requirements have to line up in order for this experience to work. Otherwise, you know, it's a no-go. I remember one of the first projects I did for Disney at Schematic, you know, if you had under 800 kilobits, they just gave you a message saying, sorry, we're not going to dilute this experience for you to go to 250 kilobits. If you don't have 800 kilobits, you can't watch Lost or Desperate Housewives, right? Like it was just, they didn't want to ruin their brand, right? By giving bad video. And so, you know, I think, you know, having decisions like that acknowledged, uh, you know, I just find that, you know, these days, again, people want want the moon but they don't necessarily want to pay for the nasa program to get to the moon and so but you know uh well what are we going to do to get there and satisfy as many of these requirements so again that's a bit of a departure from what you asked but i yeah i, I would say the, the 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 projects i'm working on right now that i find most satisfying are those that have simplified their business requirements to deliver a high-end uh, user experience to to you know the people that need to watch it. The most successful so far have been internal enterprise deployments. Like I'm doing something for a major game entertainment company right now, and all they need to do is share studio game shows with the corporate inside, right? And so, but in order to do that, they need low latency, they need super high quality, and so there's these are things that WebRTC can accommodate. Again, because they're not trying to reach the last mile of everyone, you know, who's watching the game show, just the people who are involved with the production of it. I mean, there's a reason why Adobe just paid the money they did for, uh, 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 geez, uh, why can't I remember? I uh, what? Frame, frame.io. Frame.io, thank you. I, I knew it was .io. I was going to say full time. It was frame.io. Thank you, uh, Crystal. But, you know, uh, that's a very specific market. Like, I don't need everyone and their uncle to watch a frame.io experience. That's a collaboration platform. And I so, so I think the, the use cases when they line, uh, when the business case uh, requirements lines up with what that technology can do best, it's, it's, it's that, that's when it, I find it gets very exciting. Got it. So, Crystal, um, the quality of experience was something that Robert was alluding to here, and you you talked about sort of the balance of QoS, QoE, etc. Are there minimum requirements that your partners have that you you know that if somebody falls below a threshold, um, and especially with adaptive bitrate giving you some flexibility, where you you may choose not to deliver the experience um, as opposed to delivering a poor quality one um you know we haven't had i guess too much of that where we haven't been able to meet like partner demands um you know i think where we come across that the most is obviously your super bowl scale events um because an event like that you know usually the, the ask is for everything how can we get dynamic ad insertion drm 4k um you know hdr all these kinds of things running and, and it's, it's a lot more difficult um to do things like that and so you know we've we've luckily been able to sort of work together to understand i think from a business requirement and the engineering standpoint where can we sort of meet in the middle because you know as we've all alluded to you can't have it all right now <laughs> and and you mentioned that you're trying to reduce part of your your chain where you don't need to ingest stuff into the studio and then push it up to the cloud a question came out from the audience that said what are the thoughts around encoding at the edge to reduce latency versus shipping it into the cloud to encode. And that sort of gets to this hybrid model of, you know, let's do our encoding here and push the different uh, ABR bit rates uh, up into the cloud to be delivered. Is there, and I'll ask you first, Crystal, but I'll open that up to Oliver and Robert as well. So there's no like, you know, we're not spending our time doing r d on that kind of stuff it still feels something that's not necessarily uh mature enough for us to say we're going to try this in production for some of the events we do but we've certainly read up on a lot of those things and so when we talk about you know earlier when i alluded to being able to capture directly from a stadium and, and ingesting that way you know those are ideas that we want to sort of push through and i think over the years we're going to start to see more of that you know whether it's a lot of edge a lot of our services i think are going to start moving to the edge you know we've, there's been talk about like ad tech all these kinds of things like how does it 
how does it optimize the end-to-end -end chain when there are sort of all of these different services running on the edge? And so I think you're, you'll start to see a bigger push there, especially as CDN and edge compute becomes more popular. Okay, all right. And I'm gonna open it up to one of the two of you, Robert or Oliver, to answer that because we've got another question I'd like to get to before the end. I'll defer yeah, well, to Oliver on that. Okay. All right. So we, we don't do encoding on the edges, but we do some kind of intelligence on the edges uh, to keep the latency low. Uh, so there's a close connection between the uh, receiver and the server parts uh, compared to kind of passive modes and HLS and dash players. So there's some, some kind of intelligence uh, makes sense, but uh, very much depends on what you would like to do. And you might also introduce uh, additional challenges here. Okay, so um, there are actually two questions that have popped up. One is HESP. Um, do we see any future in that? Um, lower startup latencies and scalable continuous streaming deliveries. Um, anybody wanna take that one? I'll, I'll just say that it, it hasn't really come up with any of the, the problems that my clients have brought to me yet. So I haven't had one client with an HESP you know, technical requirement or where that would have fit in nicely. Um, so, you know, it, it's similar to Dash for me. You know, I find that, you know, you're, in Europe, Dash is a much bigger, you know, audience for it or there's a demand for it. I don't know if they just, you know, don't like HLS or what, but most of, I would say every deployment I've done for North American and outside of North America has been HLS, just period, because it, it, it's become the de facto standard of streaming. Like, you know, every platform has to support it, you know, if they want to be, you know, relevant, I would say. Um, and so, um, I, 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 you know, I'm not, again, I'm not saying there aren't benefits to using HESP and I've played with a little on my own, just, just so I know what's going on with it. But to date, I haven't had any client come to me with an HE, HESP problem. So I can't comment on it. And then the final question here, um, do we, what responsibility is it within sort of the whole interactive ecosystem to solve the bring your own device problem as it relates to viewers? I mean, Oliver, you mentioned you do things in web browsers, not really much call for, for apps, but what happens if you get a customer who says, you know, I want to make sure that people can also look at this on a mobile device and we have this app that we'd like to try to contain it within. How does that play out? So if it comes to security, which is, of course, an important point for many vendors, um, there are several ways to solve that. So we try to do that with uh, different approaches, um, working behind firewalls, uh, allowing VPN access or HTTP ports as uh, standard ports, and not make it too complex for the network admins, and also using kind of standard, industry standard um, access tokens like uh, other others do as well. So it's uh, something which needs to be in collaboration with the uh, with the vendor and um, is usually specific to the use case. So there's not usually um, a one, one fits all solution for these concerns. Okay, very good. Eric, I'm going to turn it back over to you, but I'd first like to say thank you to all our panelists for being here with us today. Yeah, that was terrific. As always, you keep thinking that maybe someday the latency topic isn't going to be so uh, top of mind, but it always is. So that was great hearing from a number of different perspectives on the role that latency plays. So again, yes, thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Tim, for moderating. Thank you to our attendees. And we do have a winner for the $50 Amazon gift card. And that is Jeffrey Longbottom. So Jeffrey, you will get an email from uh, Streaming Media in the next day or so, letting you know how to get your gift card. So that wraps things up on the latency panel. We'll see some of you again, hopefully, in a half an hour when we talk about moving your workflows to the cloud. Thanks again.